Hi everybody, so it's cool, it's connecting. Uh, very nice uh, afternoon to you if you're in Europe, very good morning if you're in the US, very good evening if you're in Asia. And this uh, session, say, is my kind of Christmas present to, uh, to you guys. Uh, a number of you have asked a question in the, in the forums, Facebook, LinkedIn uh, and YouTube, of course, uh, in the last weeks, and therefore I'm online now. To, um, to answer to your questions. There's no timing, um, so I'll be there as long as you have questions. And um, there is just maybe one rule, which is that the format for this type of consultation, for this type of, sorry, event is not a clinical format in the sense that I cannot diagnose you. So, you know, the idea is not that we go back and forth um, asking, uh, well, and what if this and what if that, etc. Et the idea is really that we, um, you ask a question and I have a direct answer to it. But we really can't go to a back and forth uh, chat because it will be uncomfortable to, to many. Um, maybe let's start by uh, a short introduction. Um, I'm Olivier Girard, I'm an ergonomist, a posture therapist. The um, author of this book, which is the Porsche Manual, which will be uh, translated in English and available in English within a few weeks. And I'm also the creator of two online programs. One is the 10 weeks online backsliding program, really for people who want to invest in their health, who want to, say, find simple, non-expensive, risk-free ways to improve their posture. And I have a shorter program, mainly for companies, which is the 24 days stiff neck program. It's more the surface of the long program, but it's more suitable for, say, hundreds of people at the same time. The first um, question was uh, that I got, uh, this one was on Facebook, I think, was, well, what do you think of uh, people and videos and paper that say that there is no perfect posture? Well, that's a very good question. And I think that before that, it's important to define what we call posture. There are five basic postures. Uh, sitting, standing, lying down, on force, on kneeling. And you see, the trick is that, okay, I'm standing now, but still now I'm also standing. And like this I'm standing, and like that I'm standing. So I'm standing in many different ways. And therefore, they are not, well, they are five basic postures. But there's an infinite number of interpretations of this posture. So what I call posture in the context of my work, of this channel, of my book, of my videos and everything, is what you do with every muscle and joint of your body 24-7, whether you're aware or not, whether you're doing it voluntarily or not. Okay? And therefore, to the question, is there a perfect posture? Well, I think it's a non-question, because basically what you do to your body, why you have shoulder pain, why you have back pain, why you have neck pain, is not a matter of posture. Or rather, it's not just a matter of posture. It's a matter of what you do, for how long, in which posture, and in which psychological state. So the four together, not only posture, play a role. In the four, I name them posture, activity, duration, and stress. Let me put stress aside for a minute, and let's just focus on the biomechanical factors, which are posture, activity, duration. As I told you, what I call posture is, do you stand, do you sit, etc. And once you stand, it's also, do you stand like this, or do you stand like that? No, these are two different standing postures, because my elbow is not in the same position. This is posture. What is activity? Activity is, is my elbow relaxed, or is it tense like this? Yeah? And then, once I've understood in the angle of every joint and the tension in your body, then I will look at how long have you been doing this. What creates tension in your body is manual handling, so lifting loads, cold, shocks and vibrations, and of course, stress. When I say how long you've been doing it, I mean every time scale. I mean since you were born. How long have you had your phone? This year, this month, today, since your last break. So we're basically talking about how you organize your time. 
And my answer to people saying there is no perfect posture is I say, that's not the question. The question is, how can you find a match between posture, activity, duration, i.e. you can only take one risk at a time. Meaning that you can have a bad posture, it's not a problem, you can stand on one leg, you can cross your legs when you sit. They are not great postures, but they are not a problem as long as they don't last for too long and as long as you don't lift something whilst in this posture. Okay? So, the idea is not to have a perfect posture, the idea is to have a good match between posture, activity, duration. And you see, the problem, uh, okay, what we would call a good posture, is a posture that did distributes your weight across many tissues. Why is it a good posture? Because if every tissue participates in carrying your weight, well, they can do it for longer. So it is the posture that allows you to lift heavy weights or to stay at work for long. This is what we're aiming at. But of course next to that you need to move. So there's not one single posture. There's one posture or one family of postures which distribute the load well on your tissues. And next to that you need to relax your body very frequently and you have the freedom to choose whatever posture you want as long as it doesn't last for long and as long as you don't do anything dangerous. So again, my answer to this first question which is what do you think of people saying that there is no perfect posture is that this is a non-question, it doesn't matter. For those who joined us, welcome, feel free to ask uh, any question you may have and meanwhile I um, take the list of questions that was sent to me via the social networks. Okay, so this is for the idea of perfect posture. Uh, talking about moving, how would you feel if we would do a small uh, relaxation exercise? Let's all do this uh, together if you like. Well, the, the relaxation exercise, I'm going to lower a bit the cam, goes like this. It goes like you have your feet parallel, because if your feet are in parallel, so they are the cowboy, you see your pelvis is going to go forward, and this is hollowing your lower back. So we have the feet parallel. Then what we'll do is we'll keep the knees flexed, gently flexed, yeah? And we're going to lock the knees there. And if you lock your knees, well, you see that your back is also hollow. So that's not something we want, and therefore we're going to keep the knees relaxed. And third step, yeah? If your pelvis is forward, your back is hollow. So to do the relaxation exercise, we're going to push the pelvis back like I would give you a kick in the belly and you stay with your pelvis behind you. And let's go for the relaxation. So this, what I'm showing you now, is a wrist uh, movement, you know, flexion, extension. And then we're going to throw the thumbs. And then we relax the elbows. Gently, you see, I'm super relaxed. My mentor in Holland, she's an old lady, she always says, well, do like the wind will move your arms. And now we go to shoulder level, yeah? So I basically relax my body from the extremities to the ground. And then you activate your cervical, i.e. your neck. Gently turn your head from left to right. And then you're gonna turn your whole body, yeah? without hitting the chair like I just did. <laughs> and from there, you're going to flex your chin in between your collarbones and very gently, whilst still rotating your upper body, you will flex forward, always looking backwards, so looking behind you. And thereby, you're stretching and mobilizing your spine one level after the other. And you go back. In a few questions, I will show you the quick version of this exercise, but you see that what I just showed you now lasts like 40 seconds or something, so it's almost nothing, you know? Um, the idea of this quick relaxation exercise is that you can, you know, practice it super frequently so that the muscle tension doesn't have time to build up in your body. You have to see muscle tension a bit as an exponential like this. And the idea is, you know, if you try to reduce the muscle tension when it's up there, well, good luck, my friend, you know? I mean, you, it's not going to be easy. But if you now manage to break this muscle tension before it goes up, well, then we can talk about staying in a good health. Okay? 
So that was the uh, the this uh, muscle relaxation exercise in between. Again, I show you the very short version of it in a few questions. In a few questions here, I have a question from um, from Melissa. Um, Melissa is on YouTube actually, and she feels um, you know she has sciatica and she feels um, more pain when she when she cooks. You know, sciatica can have two origins. Sciatica can come from your discs, yeah, from a disc hernia, but it can also come from your buttocks uh, because the sciatic nerve goes through a deep muscle here, which is called the piriformis muscle. And if you have your hand on your buttock and you stand on one leg, you feel that the muscle contracts under your hand, yeah? What this means in practice is that I see a lot of uh, sciatic pain uh, due to the piriformis, and that is especially in people who sit for too long too bad or who stand up for too long too bad. I'm going to close the, the blinds a bit, it's going to be more comfortable for you. Okay? And therefore, Melissa, what I think is that there are two things that you should be aware. Number one, you shouldn't cook on one leg, like I'm doing like this. Number two, when we get tired of prolonged standing, we have a tendency to have the pelvis forward like this. So maybe you will also observe that you have, you know, the, the, the kitchen table around here and that you, you, you cook like that. I will show you an alternative to avoid that, but uh, basically bear in mind that you want your pelvis to stay a bit behind you that means that there should always be space between the table, whatever it may be, or the working plane, and your belly button. Now, it's very difficult to stand static like this for, for, for a long time, you know. I mean, you're going to get tired and you're going to go on one leg. But there is a technique that I'm going to show you now to reduce the problem. Look, the technique is the following. The technique is, instead of having your two feet at the same level, you will put one foot two inches uh, forward, yeah? And I call this now the pendulum technique. Pendulum means that my whole body is moving back and forth like this. You see, when I'm shifting my weight forward, my rear heel is coming off the ground. And when I'm, my weight is backwards, my front toes are off the ground. So basically, I'm going like this. And I can combine that with knee movements and I can of course put the other foot in front. Again, it's not big distance between your feet, yeah? You move your foot like two inches forward. So that's um, the, uh, the, the idea. The, um, when I did this test that was at the airport, I tried to uh, stand with my two feet at the same level and see how long I could hold it. Well, answer, I could hold it, still need to raise the camera, I could hold it for five minutes, yeah? After five minutes, I was going on one leg. When I was doing this pendulum technique, yeah, I could hold it for 50 minutes, meaning 10 times more, 10 times more, sorry. Therefore, this technique that I just showed you is a technique that will help you stand for longer without feeling so tired. Um, it's typically a technique that you can use in the museum also, or when you wait for public transports. That's technique number one. Technique number two is quite simple, is to say, well, you know, if you give your weight or part of your weight to a third party, your tissues will have to bear less. Meaning that if I lean my belt on the wall, the wall bears part of my weight and therefore it is easier for me to stand for a prolonged period of time and therefore I can do this also. Yeah? So, you know, typically there are some cooking activities that uh, you need to do on your feet, but there are some others for which you can lean on the wall or lean on the working plane or lean on somewhere else. Yeah? 
So that would be uh, my first advice to you, Melissa, is offset your feet and do this technique. As I told you, the second advice and the goal of this technique is to keep the pelvis slightly backwards and you should avoid to have your feet pointing outwards like this. Okay? Um, there's one more thing I wrote down that I should tell you is about the um, height. You know, especially if your husband or your, um, or your wife is taller or smaller than you are, both of you are, will not be comfortable uh, working at uh, this height in your kitchen. So what is the ideal height for cooking actually? That's a question. Well, look, your goal should be to do more, say, normal activities such as touch typing and things with your fingers at elbow height. As soon as you do something a bit precise, you want your elbows to be bent, say, more than 90 degrees, so you want to work above elbow level. And as soon as you do something which requires a bit of strength or a bit of force, you want your um, hands to be lower than your arms. Depending on the activity, I would say cooking will be between elbow height and a bit lower than that. But that is not the height of the plate, that is the height of your hand. And then you have a utensil, yeah, like a spoon or like anything, or like a fork, and then the bowl comes down here. Yeah? So you see, typically, if you're shaking, uh, if you're um, cooking, say, a chocolate cake, for example, and you have to mix it like this, well, if you want to mix the chocolate cake with your elbow uh, 90 degrees or slightly more, that means that the bottom of the bowl should be here. And this is surely much more the height of the bottom of the sink than the height of the working plane. So as soon as you need to use strength, lower the thing. Now, let's take another example. I, I cut some sausage, yeah, not my finger, but some sausage or some vegetable, doesn't matter. Well, there my working height is the height of the knife. And you see that this is more or less elbow level. So if I cut vegetable, well, the height of the working plane will be all right. Okay, so this is a bit, um, I mean, it's not directly related to your question because your question is on lower back, but I thought that for your neck, it's useful that uh, you have this information. Okay, um, shall we go to the next question? Feel free to ask any question you may have, of course, eh? and the chat is open. And this question is from Azur Athena, who is um, um, a fan, I don't know if you should call it like this, or at least she subscribed to my uh, Facebook page there. And she has a question on frozen shoulder, in particular, um, how should she treat frozen shoulder? Well, if she knows that it's frozen shoulder, probably um, she has been to a physio or uh, her doctor. And this would be my first advice. I mean, as soon as you have pain that lasts for more than three days, or which is always worse in the evening than the morning, or which is worse on Fridays than on Mondays, or that doesn't go over the weekend, or that doesn't go over the holidays, you have to see your GP or your physio. Okay? That is thing number one. That is to put a diagnosis on the, on the table. Now, also bear in mind that most physios, most orthopaths, most chiropractors, most doctors are trained in doing something to you. And doing something to you will therefore mainly be about resolving the symptoms of the injury. Yeah? If I massage you, if I etc., that will not change your behavior, and your behavior has caused the injury. So I know. Go to your hands-on therapist, uh, physio or steroid, but unless you had an accident, in which case the causes are gone, if we're talking about overuse, which is something that you create because of your daily habits, you also need to change your daily habits. And in most cases, your physiotherapist will not be a specialist of changing your habits. This is the job of people like me. Uh, and unfortunately, there are not many people like me because uh, the education 
that I have or the, 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 is, is not really well developed uh, worldwide. It's mainly in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, but apart from that, it doesn't exist so much. So you can always contact me. Um, let's look, therefore, at the causes of frozen shoulder. When we talk about frozen shoulder, there's very, very often, if not, well, if not always, an involvement of the supraspinatus muscle. The supraspinatus muscle is the muscle that raises your elbow to the side. Okay? So there are three things in your daily habits that you need to change to. Thing number one is everything which you do with the elbow spread to the side. If you work uh, with, an, uh, with an office job, you will here typically recognize a mouse which is too far from the keyboard. Okay? And so this is the first thing that you need to avoid. But it can also be, um, say, you see everything which you do with the desk which is too high will also spread your uh, elbows to the side. So if your desk is too high, and I'm, I'm really exaggerating now, and you have a normal keyboard, you see that your elbows are spread to the side. This is also the problem that we have actually in the watchmaking industry. No? People are always working at that. So monitor everything that you do with your elbow sideways um, and you know just let your elbow go and put the tool right under your fingertips. And from that you'll draw the right conclusions. You will see that your mouse better be vertical, that your desk better be at elbow height, etc etc so thing number one in term, in, when discussing frozen shoulder is let's avoid that the elbow goes sideways thing number two that we want to avoid is that you know you push this bone the humerus into the head of the shoulder because it, because it will compress the tendon of the supraspinatus what is this it's that as soon as you lean on your elbow, whether at work, whether in the car, whether wherever you want, you will worsen um, the frozen shoulder. And you see, if you need your elbow to stabilize your upper body, it means that your upper body is not stabilized somewhere else. And in particular, it means that you're not using your lumbar support enough. If you're firmly against your lumbar support, you don't need to, um, to lean on your elbow. So, you know, after you've analyzed everything which you do here, analyze what you do there, and see what it takes to get off from the elbow. And what it takes will be often a lumbar support. Now, clearly the lumbar support will not be enough for you to sit for two hours in a row. But on that topic, let's be clear, not one human being can sit for two hours in a row without putting his or her health at risk. Yeah? You should stand, say, every 25 minutes at least. Okay? So that means that, uh, basically, you need to, uh, to stand up more often if you don't want to get tired and start leaning on your elbow. So thing number one, elbows spread. Thing number two, leaning on your elbow. Thing number three, carrying your shopping bags or your purse uh, we, um, down your, your arm like this, because this is really pulling the, uh, the arm somehow um, out of the, of the shoulder joint. And this is, again, um, increasing the, the, the strain on the supraspinatus and its tendon. So you want to, to, to monitor these three things mainly, and I would cite one last one, which is not a direct cause of frozen shoulder, but it doesn't help your shoulder recover, is forward shoulder. Yeah? As soon as your shoulders are round, well, immediately you put more pressure in your shoulder joint, and that will make it more difficult for it to, 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 to heal. So you really want to work on that. And if you check, there's a video on the channel, which is, um, uh, I think it's forward head posture, is the, um, is the road to hell or something. It's just like forward head posture and you'll see it. 
um, you will see that it's quite a complex approach because actually your shoulders go around as soon as you sit in a slouch posture or as soon as you stand with your pelvis forward. So you see there are many causes to what's wrong here and you need to really fix them from the ground upwards. So it's, it's, it's a complete re-education work that we need to do there. Um, last thing there, when you have a frozen shoulder, basically you can't do this comfortably or you can't do that comfortably. Yeah? And of course you need to preserve the range of motion of your shoulder joint, otherwise you will lose it. But if you always do this exercise, it's an effort against gravity and that's quite heavy on your shoulder joint. There is an easy way to bring your elbow near to your, um, near to your ear, which is flex your chin forward and bend forward. So actually you see the relaxation in the size that I just showed you is also an excellent way to preserve the mobility of your shoulder joint. So once you're there in this position, the idea is that you move your arms front back, yeah, and then uh, front back desynchronized, then sideways, then sideways crossing each other, and then you can combine these two in zeros, say, one way or the other, or in eights, one way or the other. I'm always looking behind me. If you want to do it less slow, you can no problem. Okay? This exercise, you need to do it like, I would say, every hour at least, if you have a frozen shoulder. So on this condition, my advice is fight the causes, the three ones that I told you, which are this, that, and holding things down your arm. And next to that, make sure that you relax your shoulder extremely frequently. Okay. Now, I have three more questions, unless you... Uh, come up with even more. Um, the first question I have is, is a simple one, is where should my mouse be? Yeah? Well, look, what's relaxed for your elbows is to be here. Yeah? So where you should, your mouse should be is where your elbows are relaxed and then you just bend your elbow 90 degrees. And you see that therefore the ideal distance to your mouse is uh, the length of your forearm. Yeah? Now, many people have central pointing device and that means like the touchpad on your laptop and they find it cool. The problem with that is, look, as soon as you work on your touchpad, your elbow goes sideways and that spreads your elbow to the side so it overloads the neck and the shoulder area. So where the mouse should be is in front of your elbows at forearm distance from your elbow. I see that we have two questions, one from George. Okay, you feel dizzy all the time, you have cervicogenic headaches in the neck, and you're asking me what to do. Well, you know, you should uh, check the video that is on, the, on my channel, which is called Sternocleidomastoid. I'm typing it because it's, it's quite a difficult uh, name. Sternocleidomastoid. Yeah, this one is really responsible for a lot of dizziness, migraines and things, and pain around the eyebrow. Um, this muscle is typically involved in forward head posture. And, well, somehow, you know, once you have the proper strategy, it's not too difficult to get rid of it, but it takes a lot of effort. Why? Because in your upper body, so I'm cutting you here, yeah, there's a chicken and egg story with three actors. Actor number one is when your mid-back goes round. Then what happens is that your shoulders move forward and therefore your head goes forward. And each one of these three is both the cause and the consequence of the two others. Meaning that if your mid-back is round, your shoulders move forward, your head moves forward. Yeah? So this is something that you need to fight. And the way you will fight it is, well, fight forward pelvis position, fight, slouching, and all this. Then I said, when your shoulders are round, same problem, everything goes off. The way you will fight round shoulders 
is by stretching your pecs, by not doing push-ups whereas you don't train on your lower trapezius, and by avoiding everything that you do with your arms out, uh, stretched forward like this. That could be, for example, having your keyboard you know, forward because you have your paper documents in front of you. If so, you need to have your keyboard in front of you and your paper documents between the screen and the keyboard. And um, then, I'm going to take this, and then the last thing you usually need to do is check the direct causes of forward head posture, which is, for example, poor vision. Is it a good idea to train shoulder retraction? No, it isn't. Or at least not per se. Why not? There are two reasons for that. Number one is if your shoulders are forward and you do what our parents have told you to do, which is pull your shoulders back, you do this, and this is using your rhomboids, so bringing your shoulder blades together, and it's actually straining your neck a lot. This is one problem. The second problem is, look, if I slouch in my mid-back, automatically shoulders and head go forward. If I'm like this, and I pull my shoulder back, did I change anything? Of course not. I'm just always straining my body, because the solution was, I mean, that the shoulders were forward was the result of something else. And this something else was that I was slouching. So what I need to do is take it from there and then my, um, my shoulders will reopen. So basically, um, the, um, say, the, the shoulder retraction should be what you observe as the result of correcting your posture should not be something that you do independently from correcting the rest. It doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to reinforce the lower trapezius, but it just means it's not enough. And before I switch to the next uh, question, I will show you, it's good for everybody, a good exercise for training the lower trapezius. But again, bear in mind that it will not be enough to resolve shoulders forward, it takes a global approach. This exercise is like this. You keep your elbows to your side and your palms facing the ceiling. Yeah? You could do this with an elastic band between your hands also no problem. Huh? And what you'll do is whilst keeping your elbows against your torso, you're just going to spread your hands outwards like this. And the exercise will come from the fact that you keep your elbows against you. And then you can reopen your elbows and feel the tension. Yeah? So this is a strengthening exercise for the lower trapezius. It will work only if you do it with your pelvis backwards. Yeah? Because if you do it with your pelvis forward, as we said, you have the mid back round, the shoulders forward, and you, can, and you can just not activate your lower trapezius. So this is the... Uh, the, 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 the thing with the with with the shoulder retraction. Okay. Now, um, Wolfgang, sorry, Wolfgang, sorry, my apologies for uh, your name, not not spelling your name correctly, said that um, you're fighting with posterior shoulder pain since over a year. Yeah, it's actually kind of often the same, you know. What's very interesting is to observe that everybody has the same problem, to be honest with you. Everybody has problem with uh, for, um, shoulders forward, yeah? And this is because we spend a lot of time on our smartphones, because we sit for too much and blah, blah, blah. And this round shoulder posture, for some of us, will mainly strain the trapezius and therefore create pain here. For some others, will mainly strain the sternocleidomastoid and will therefore create migraines and dizziness. For some others, it will strain the rhomboids because they're spread apart and it will create pain over here. For some others, it will create, uh, contract the serratus anterior here. All these are muscles that you can find in the playlist now, by the way. Um, and therefore, the pain will be felt under the armpit 
and in the corner of the shoulder blade, etc. But basically, these are different facets of one same problem, the same problem being round shoulders posture. Yeah? And really, I advise that you have a look at my video uh, on uh, forward head. I will, uh, if you just give me a minute, I will put the link in the, in the chat because uh, you, you really need to, to, to see that. Just give me a minute. I'm putting the list, the, the, the link of the video. Forward head. Okay. It is here. And share. Copy. Okay, I put it in the chat. This is your first item on your to-do list if you feel these pains that are due to that. It's really your first uh, item on your to-do list. Um, just checking the... Um, yeah, just to, to um, complete my answer, uh, Wofu. The, um, you know, working for nine hours a day on your computer is a lot. But what you need to understand is that it's not the same to work nine times, uh, say, one hour, or one time nine hours. In other words, as the muscle tension goes like an exponential like this, if you work almost nine hours in a row, in the evening the muscle tension is up there. If you work 18 times 30 minutes, you work 30 minutes, you have a bit of muscle tension, but you do relaxation exercise goes down. Same 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And you see that your tension level in the evening is therefore much lower. So what you really need to do is to include very, very, very frequent breaks uh, in your day. And don't think that this is gonna waste your time. It's not gonna waste your time. Every study has shown that people who take short, regular breaks stay fresher, fresher in their mind, fresher in their body and therefore they work more, faster, and with fewer mistakes than people who don't take short breaks. And I think that this is an excellent transition to show you the short relaxation routine which just takes 10 seconds. What we're gonna do is you're, you're just gonna you know, jump on the spot for five seconds, so this is shaking your collarbones. And then for five more seconds, you're gonna do the spiral like this, and thereby you're uh, relaxing your, your neck. So if you do this 10 seconds, say every 20 minutes, that will take you 30 seconds per day, which is, yeah, not even five uh, 30 seconds per hour, which is not even five minutes uh, on your working day. So it's really nothing. But you need to do these frequent breaks. Everybody does. I also need. It's not because it's my job that my physiology is different. We all have the bu a body that needs to, to take breaks. Now, I have two more questions here on the, um, that can be on the social networks. One is what do I think of super large monitors? Well, what I think of super large monitors is two things. There's width and there's height. In terms of height, your visual field is entirely below horizontal. So the problem with super large monitors, and I'm, for example, thinking of the iMac, you know, which has a big screen and this, and this uh, foot, screen foot here, is that it's too high. So one problem with super large monitors is when they are too high, but not all of them are, are too high. The other problem is, you know, this is the width of your visual field. And super large monitors are wider than that. So what this means is that you don't have the whole screen in your visual field and therefore you need to rotate your neck more and this means more asymmetric postures. And being all day in asymmetric postures is going to strain your neck. Yeah? In particular the levator scapulae which creates pain here yeah? and the upper trapezius which creates pain here and there and there. Okay? So basically, you know, what I think of super large monitors is that they should not be used just because everybody uses them. It's not a reason enough. Um, I know it's in fashion, but you know, um, I'm managing two companies 
and writing my second book on, on a 24-inch screen monitor. I mean, you can do many things on a, on, on a single monitor. There are exceptions though, in particular if you're a business analyst or a business controller and you need to have two Excels next to each other. In that case, we can talk about having two monitors. But basically, the idea would be to say, well, try to work as much as you can, 80% of your activities right in front of you and organize your windows such as what's to the side is things that you use much less. Yeah? And what you really want to avoid is that there's nothing in front of you and that one window is to the left, one window is to the right. That should not be your normal way of working. It should just be the exception when you really need to compare two things at the same time. So this is a bit my opinion on super large monitors. Honestly, uh, yeah, I see a lot. I mean, honestly, a lot of companies call me and say, well, the guys in the company, they want super large monitors because they've seen it on the web or because their colleagues have it, la 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 la. That's the wrong reason, yeah? So when there's something like this, well, give me a call, give me a mail, and let's have a Zoom and let's discuss with HR or procurement or something so that we don't buy something which is not really uh, useful for everybody. The last question I have here is, and if you have any, feel free, is do you have any suggestion for dry eyes? I have three suggestions for dry eyes. Suggestion number one is check your airco. You know, airco tends to dry the air, and if the air is drier, well, there's more evaporation from the cornea, and therefore your eyes get drier. Second thing is check um, visual discomfort and the sources of visual discomfort. What I mean with that in particular is glare. Or reflections in your screen. If you work uh, with a window in front of you or with a lamp behind you or window behind you, there are reflections in your visual field and basically every time your eyes come to a dark or to light spot they need to reaccommodate. and this will create tiredness and under the effect of tiredness you tend to blink less and by blinking less um, because you focus more you know, when you go like this your eyes will get drier. And the other thing, this is the third uh, bit, uh, part of my answer, is, uh, as I just mentioned with the breaks, careful to take enough breaks. It's really important that you take enough breaks because um, basically when you focus on the task, your eyes will blink eight to ten times less. Yeah? And what's keep what's keeping the eyes humid is to blink. So if you blink less, well, your eyes get drier. And therefore, there's this 20-20-20 rule, which is that every 20 minutes you should relax your eyes for 20 seconds by looking 20 uh, feet uh, away. Meaning that you need very short regular breaks so that your eyes can blink again and re-humidify the, the cornea. Okay, my friends, that's um, it for, for my part. I'm just um, checking if we have more questions from you guys. I don't see any. So basically, well, let me know in the comments if you uh, like the, uh, the exercise. If so, uh, I, I will gladly uh, have more uh, Q&A sessions like this. Uh, but in the meantime, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Happy uh, holidays if you have uh, any, and I'll be looking forward to uh, speak, speaking with the community again in, uh, in 2021. You take care and uh, think of doing enough breaks. Bye-bye.